It is a truth universally acknowledged that there are three basic types of music fans. There are those people who really can't stand the song Stay Away to Heaven. There are those people who really like Stay Away to Heaven. And then there are those people who used to like Stay Away to Heaven and can't stand it anymore. So uh, that's the theme of this video really. Why it is that I still like Stay Away to Heaven after so many years. So this was partly inspired by a thread that's been going around uh, in recent memory all about songs that are overplayed on the radio. I saw Mike, PC31, doing a uh, response to this and he talked about Stay Away to Heaven and how it was a song he used to really like but now he just literally cannot stand to listen to it. And um, I think that is a fairly common response to the song. <laughs> And uh, I do find it interesting because over the years it's almost become a cliché, as much of a cliché as the song itself, to say that the song is overplayed, if that makes sense. And um, Mike is a guitarist, I think, and um, one thing that I will say is I'm, I'm not a guitarist. I mean, I do play the guitar a bit, but I'm not a, you know, I'm not a guitarist, so I haven't spent... Uh, lots and lots of time in my life in guitar shops. Mike was saying that um, I think he said there's a guitar shop that he frequents now where you are actually banned from playing Stairway to Heaven so you get thrown out of the shop if you <laughs> if you try and strum it. And um, I've, I've heard stories of that kind before certainly it is the great cliche you get a guitar down from the wall in a guitar shop you sit there and you start strumming the opening chords to Stairway to Heaven. I'm pretty sure I've heard that happening uh, with my own ears and uh, seeing it with my own eyes. But um, I guess, uh, well, there's a couple of things I want to say about Stairway to Heaven. So let's just get a, a little bit of personal history out of the way first. So I first heard the song, I'm going to say, in about 1981, maybe 82. And um, it was courtesy of my dad's copy of Led Zepp IV. Now, the eagle-eyed among you might notice that there is something slightly amiss with this record cover. Uh, and uh, that is thanks to my 11-year-old self deciding that it wasn't really on, that they hadn't put their... Uh, that the band had not put their name on the cover. So I basically stuck a sticker on there, or two, it's two stickers in fact, I managed to uh, mess up by not leaving myself enough room to get the Zeppelin part on, so I had to put a second sticker on the end there with the in, and on the back as well I decided it wasn't, um, it re really wasn't on for them not to include the um, song uh, titles there, and also uh, the band's names there, which I got from a book in the school library, and I remember sitting in my English lesson reading this book and reading about Led Zeppelin and learning about who they all were so I wrote their names down on a piece of paper went home and then stuck them on the back of my dad's record he didn't mind this record he would bought this record as a gift for my mother back in the early 70s but neither of them had liked it so it had ended up on the shelf I can't remember why he brought this to me and gave it to me. It was during a period where he'd been doing a little bit of that. He'd realised that I was getting really into pop music, so he dug out his old copy of Dark Side of the Moon, Revolver, the original soundtrack by 10CC. There were a few records that he'd bought himself. He was quite a curious guy. He Pop music wasn't really his thing, but he was interested in hearing the important records. He had work colleagues who would recommend things to him and he would buy them. Sometimes he would like them, sometimes he wouldn't, but even the ones he liked, they didn't really get on his turntable all that often. But now he had a son who was who was mad on pop and rock music. These records started to come off, off the shelf and he would give them to me to listen to and I can remember listening to this for the first time and not really knowing what to make of it. You know, Pink Floyd had been quite a mellifluous listening experience, Dark Side of the Moon with all that gorgeous production, the sweeping soundscapes. And um, Revolver as well, I guess, was a studio record. But this one, this was my first glimpse, I suppose, of, of hard rock heading into metal territory. Robert Plant's banshee-like shrieking voice at the start of uh, the track Black Dog at the beginning was not something I'd ever heard before. <laughs> And um, that was my first exposure to it, I guess. Now, I don't really remember too much about Stairway to Heaven until a few years later when I was about 16 and I'd uh, started to get into um, heavy metal. And on the recommendation of a friend, I bought um, Now and Zen by Robert Plant, which came out in, I think, 87 or 88. 
And on the strength of that, I went back again and listened to Stay Away to Heaven from um, Led Zeppelin 4. I think I'd started reading all about the fact that there was this legendary track that was about six minutes long. And um, then it really clicked with me then. I started listening to it a lot. I thought it was just one of the greatest things I'd ever heard. And um, I guess it just, you know, it has that epic quality, the different movements, the way it builds gradually from hardly anything really into this huge crescendo and then comes back again at the end. You know, to a 16 year old, I think at the time I was wanting to take music seriously. I was wanting to listen to things that I thought had a bit of um, heft to them, a bit of musicality, a bit of serious structure, serious musicianship. It was obvious from hearing the Jimmy Page guitar solo and all the 12 string stuff that's on there and John Bonham's drumming that this was a band that had, you know, serious chops. I suppose Led Zeppelin were the first band probably that I heard that had like real proper serious chops although I mean you know Queen did as well to be fair this is the reissue I picked up a few years ago sounds absolutely tremendous so um I would have been about 16 at the time and I did used to listen to Stairway to Heaven quite a lot I used to listen to it in the context of the album so I would listen to the album and um and this is a, this is the third copy. Um, I would listen to it in the context of the album, but I would also listen to it on its own as well. And when I went to uni in '89, I did used to annoy my friends by putting it on the jukebox. Not constantly. It wasn't kind of like every single night I went down to the Union Bar, I would put Stairway to Heaven on. But Stairway to Heaven was a song that I would put on the jukebox. I think part of it was just thinking I wanted my value for money. You know, if you were spending 50 pence to get whatever it was, two selections or something, you know, you put on a six minute track because then you felt like you were getting value for money. But also it was a song that I enjoyed hearing after a few pints. You could really get into it. You could, you know, clue into the lyrics and all the different parts. It was just a song that you could lose yourself in. But in all honesty, I don't think you know. I think this is the this is the nub of it, really. I don't think I have over listened to Stairway to Heaven. There are other songs that I'm aware of um, that I used to like, which I now can't listen to because they're just constantly on the radio all the time. Just a couple of examples. You've got things like um, "Hit Me with Your Rhythm Stick" by Ian Dury, which used to be a great favourite of mine. Uh, I used to absolutely love that record and now, I mean, it just gets played virtually every day on Radio 2 during the day. Video Killed the Radio Star, I'm a huge Buggles fan, but honestly, do I really need to hear that again? I've heard it 10 billion times. Bohemian Rhapsody, in fact, is a song that is always on Radio 2. And um, I would definitely say that all three of those songs, for me, are much more played out than Stairway. Maybe it's an American thing, maybe in North America, FM radio, it was I think it was the most requested song at one point and it was played everywhere. I read somewhere, I can't remember where, a few years ago that in the sort of eighties it was impossible. You could you couldn't turn on the radio and not find Stairway to Heaven being played somewhere. You know, if you move the dial you would find it being played. For some reason it was one of those songs which just caught on and captured the musical imagination of a generation, I suppose. And uh, it just kind of took off from there, really, and gained a life of its own. But, um, you know, for me, it's not it's not played out. I haven't heard it a billion times, and I don't listen to it anymore as a track in its own right. I very, very rarely just play Stairway to Heaven. But I did listen to this album the other night. I played it all the way through, and again, I kind of marvelled at the way... Stairway to Heaven, it just works so brilliantly at the end of side one. It comes out of the Battle of Evermore, which is a greater song in many ways, I think. I mean, it's a truly, truly evocative song with the Sandy Denny vocals, and it's just, you know, all, that, all the folky stuff in there. It's just mesmerising. And then Stairway to Heaven finishes side one, and that's the purpose of Stairway to Heaven. It, uh, it builds the side to a crescendo, comes down again at the end, and then you have Robert's voice at the end singing the final line, and it dies away. And then you turn it over and you listen to side two. So I still, I still think of Stairway to Heaven not as this great uh, or as this chronically overplayed song, but just an essential part of one of the great um, rock albums ever, classic rock albums, heavy rock albums, whatever you want to call it. So um, I mean, it's interesting because lyrically the song is very Tolkien-esque, and I've never, never been into Tolkien. I really, I'm not a fan of all that kind of fairy elf kind of stuff. Never have been. Um, I just find it really naff and really annoying. Um, 
I mean, the movies, the Lord of the Rings movies, I just couldn't stand them, you know, I really couldn't stand them. But for some reason, the lyrics of Stairway to Heaven, I know that they are meant to be sort of a bit Tolkien-esque, but I don't take it, I don't take that, I don't get that meaning from it. I see it more as a song about a relationship um, and, uh, you know, with a woman. It's kind of a love song or a love gone wrong song, I think, but it's heavily cloaked in uh, in metaphor and imagery. I do like the natural imagery, though. I've always loved the image of the bustle in the hedgerow. Um, you know, to this day, whenever I'm on a walk on a country lane, I will look at the hedgerow and you know wonder is it is there a rustle in the hedgerow or a bustle in the hedgerow, whatever the line is. It's got that kind of slightly sinister old world kind of fairy tale quality to it. I do like fairy tales. I am a fan of old creepy fairy tales. I'm just not really a fan of Tolkien. But like I said, I've never really seen a very strong Tolkien influence in Stairway. The other thing about Stairway to Heaven that I've always liked is just the mythos behind it. You know, the way it was, the way it was written and recorded. Zeppelin they started writing it at uh, Island Studios, I think, but then they, they finished it off at Headley Grange in the countryside, sat around a fire. I think there have been some writing sessions in Wales as well, you know, where they got the material together for Led Zepp 3. And John Paul Jones starts playing this pipe melody over Jimmy Page's guitar. Uh, the guitar refrain at the beginning was, he was meant to have nicked it from an old song by Spirit, wasn't he? I'm not sure if that was ever settled in court or out of court. But um, the recording of the song too, I love, I love the story about how John Bonham had, um, had done several takes of the song already and he was getting really sick of doing it. And he'd done what he considered was to be the final take because he had to sit um, quietly without playing for the first, whatever it is, you know, three and a half minutes, four minutes of the song. And then he has to come in with his big intro. And he'd done what he considered to be the definitive take. He'd gone back to the control room and they'd listened to it back and he'd thought to himself, you know, great job done, I can go to the pub. And Jimmy Page just looked at him and said, I think you've got a better one. I think you can do it better. <laughs> and Bonham apparently just said, oh God, right, okay then. So he went back into the studio again, sat there again, waited for his entrance. And this time when he came in, he really came in with this very spectacular drum intro, which really kind of screamed out, you know, this, this is the one, I'm not doing it again. And every single time I listen to the song, when it gets to that bit, I just imagine Bonham sat at his drums, you know, with steam coming out of his ears, going, right, this is the one. And, um, you know, it's stories like that, I guess, which make the song uh, last for me. And, it's a, it, you know, it's a combination of that, the musicality of the song, and also just the personal memories I have of listening to it. I used to listen to it with my dad, you know, when I was in my teens, because I wanted to try and get him to see what I liked in it. And because he was a classical music fan, it was it was nice to be able to share something with him that was, that was rock music, but which had this slightly symphonic element. It, it is sort of structured like a symphony. I think there's four, there's four separate movements, isn't it, which is very symphonic and um, just the musicianship and just the way that they were all playing together and grooving together just just a great just a great band performance but just to go back to the nub of my um, argument again or my point or whatever it is you know it's just it's not it's not a song which is played out for me i'd be interested to know if there's anybody else out there who, who kind of shares that experience who just feels there are other songs more played out than stay away to heaven there's other songs that i've heard 10 trillion times uh, that I don't need to hear again, but Stairway is not one of them. And I don't think, unless I start, you know, playing it every single day now, between now and my dying day, I probably will never get sick of it, um, because I don't listen to it all that often. So, anyway, I thought I would share that little ramble with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave me some comments below, and I'll see you in the next video.